um, that cardiac MRI and heart failure. Cardiac MRI is a tool that's been around since the, really since the late 1980s, early 1990s, but people rapidly re realize that this is actually a very nice tool. After MRI came out, a very nice tool to apply to study the heart for a, a number of uh, uh, possible advantages. And there are challenges to its use to study the heart, mainly have to do with the fact that the heart's moving. Imaging something that's moving is a little bit of a challenge, but I think we've made great strides in it, and I'm going to go over some of the applications. Um, <clears throat> so I don't have any personal disclosures. The only thing is uh, that I would like to mention is that the gadolinium-based contrast agents, or GBCA, I'll call them throughout this discussion, uh, despite all this time, are still not FDA approved for study of heart, only for um, vascular tumors, most of the agents. So why use MRI? So here's a couple of images. I hope these are playing. The movie's playing on the screen. Okay. So a uh, couple of couple of uh, images here. Those of you who are clinical will under, will recognize that the top image is a two chamber view. And are they still playing or they stop? stop? They're supposed to be playing. Supposed to keep moving. But so this is a two chamber view. But everybody did see it moving, right? So this is a two chamber view of left ventricle, left atrium, and a uh, four chamber view at the bottom, right ventricle. Right atrium, left ventricle, left atrium. So you see, you see the entire heart with this image. Unlike uh, with an echo, we have selected windows. Uh, so this we, we say is window independent. Although we do choose a two-dimensional imaging plane for most of what we do, it's uh, is window independent in in the vast majority of patients. It's uh, it's very reproducible, provided the patient meets a few characteristics, and uh, has very good spatial resolution and pretty good temporal resolution doesn't use any ionizing radiation. All advantages over certain other types of imaging techniques. One of the most important reasons why cardiac MRI is, is useful to study the heart is that volumes can be accurately measured using MRI, probably more accurately than any other t technique, any other non-invasive technique. And why are volumes important? Well, it's been known for a long, long time, uh, since the 1980s, that as the, particularly the systolic volume, as the insystolic volume increases the mortality climbs really, really steeply after you go over 50 to 60 um, milliliters per square meter of body surface area. This is known in uh, patients with valvular heart disease, patients at post-MI, po patients post-cabbage. Um, and cardiac MRI is a very nice way of measuring the volumes. So if volumes are important, this is a good way to do it. And here's how we do that. So this is a, at the top is a four chamber view with right and left ventricles. We then take the time, uh, time phases out of those and, uh, and decide on a systolic and a diastolic time phase. We then, uh, these lines that you see projected onto the four chamber view are a series of short axis parallel slices that are then brought back uh, into the short axis images. And so those are the corresponding slices there at the bottom, systolic and diastolic. So we work with that data set and then we take, for example, we take one of these. This is a, this is a uh, it looks like a systolic uh, time phase slice towards the base of the left ventricle. And you see the right ventricle there next to it. We then can draw contours, manually draw contours, or there's a, a number of automatic segmentation tools that can be used. You draw a contour for the epicardial side of the LV, then the endocardial side of the LV, and these things all can then be thought of as, di as discs on the short axis. They all have a known slice thickness. So you have an area that you measure here and then a, a thickness uh, and multiply those together and you've got a little volume, a discrete volume of this slice. You can do the same thing. So you, there's the endocardial area. You can then take the volume by just summing those slices up, the, the volumes of each of the little slices. You can even do the same thing if you want. And this is very reproducible. Um, which is, is, can be useful if you're trying to do clinical trials and you, you want to follow volumes and ejection fraction. It'll allow a, a, a significant reduction in your sample size. You can also use this if you want to determine LV mass by just using the same approach to look at the, uh, the area between the endocardium and the epicardium. And this has very, uh, excellent agreement with measured mass of left ventricle from uh, autopsy studies. Now there are some reasons, some patients you might not want to use an MRI and uh, you know, patients who are very claustrophobic. This is becoming less of a problem because MR scanners are getting bigger and they're not feeling as confined in it. Patients with very irregular rhythms are still a problem because we gate the, the, uh, the images to the ECG and we, we take multiple heartbeats to reconstruct an image. If the, uh, it's 
It's hard enough to image a patient with a moving heart, moving the heart while it, uh, image the heart while it's moving. If you also couple that to the diaphragm moving and the heart changing its, its spatial position within the scanner, it makes it even harder. So we typically do these with breath holding. And patients will generally need to be able to hold their breath for somewhere between 6 and 14 seconds in order to get a good image. So if the patient can't do that, they're probably not a good candidate. Certain types of implanted devices can be a problem, although this is uh, changing. And um, availability is not necessarily widespread, although not bad right now. There's pretty good penetration of this technique in the community. So one of the reasons why uh, cardiac MRI is very useful for study of heart failure is, not, is beyond the volumes is the ability to characterize the tissue. So this is important in, in cardiomyopathies. So this is, uh, tip, this is overwhelmingly based on the use of gadolinium contrast or the GBCAs. Um, and the way that they distribute. So when you administer these agents intravenously, they then circulate, they uh, reach the arterial side of the circulation, they, they then perfuse the myocardium, and these agents do not, the ones that we typically use do not go into the cells. They don't go into cardiomyocytes. So they stay in the extracellular space. They leak out through the capillaries and stay in the extracellular space. So it's a, by measuring the uh, amount of the contrast in tissue, it's a good way of assessing the extracellular volume. This was recognized fairly early on as a, um, with the development of a certain type of technique which is very sensitive to the presence of contrast that you can uh, determine different types of, um, of myocardial injury or, or tissue changes. So see at the top, is the, is the mouse working? Can you see the mouse for it? Nope. I can do this. Okay, this is working. So here you can see this is a senior cardiomyopathy or a senior injury. You can see this presence of bright magnesium contrast, bright signal, and the southern cardio side is less difficult to dissipate with LED territory in function, the anterior wall, anterior septum, and it's subject to cardio. Also in the, in the anterior septum, the anterior wall, but this is not something of cardinal. This is on the upper part of the mid, mid wall side. And uh, though it may fit a dimension distribution, it's not perfect. And then this is a T2 wave image, so this is looking for myocardial gene. Another, another, and this is not dependent on contact. Uh, cardiac sarcoidosis has a very patchy, you see all this, this bright signal all over the place, not fit in the vascular distribution. So the, the ability to look at where the abnormal contrast is located helps you to differentiate the, um, the pattern of cardiomyopathy. So now I'll go into specific applications in, uh, in heart failure. So ischemic cardiomyopathy obviously is a very common etiology. And it was recognized, once this technique came out, this is an example of this bottom panel that you see below the movie. The bottom panel is a, it's a corresponding image. This is a so-called three-chamber view, or uh, sort of the left ventricle, some of the right ventricle, the apex. And uh, the lower panel is the corresponding image after gadolinium contrast was administered. So you see this nice uh, bright subendocardial distribution of abnormal contrast in, the, uh, in the, pretty much the entire septum, the apex. And uh, you, you see L, an LV thrombus there, the dark signal at the apex is, uh, is an LV thrombus. So once people realize that we could do this, <clears throat> you could quantify how much of the, of the ventricle is affected by the infarction. This represents an MI. And so what do we really want to do with ischemic cardiomyopathy? We'd, we'd like to revascularize it and make it better, make the segment move better, have improved contractive function. Um, <clears throat> 18 years ago now, uh, Kim and Judd, they were at Northwestern at the time, they're now at Duke, recognized that they could use this technique and by measuring the transmural extent, <clears throat> or the, the, uh, the, the, how far across the myocardium, the total thickness of the myocardium that this abnormal contrast stretches, helps to determine the, uh, the likelihood that the segment will improve its contractile function if you revascularize it. So um, if you look there, just looking at this on uh, the left-hand side of the, of the bar chart, the all dysfunctional segments, 
in uh, patients who had no, no gadolinium enhancement at all, no abnormal gadolinium enhancement, they have an 80% chance, the segment has an 80% chance of recovery of function if you revascularize it. And then there's a monotonic decrease in that as you, as you increase your amount of uh, transmural extent of contrast. So we typically consider that if there's 1 to 25% of a quarter of the thickness or less is, um, is enhancing, then the, the patient, that segment has an excellent likelihood or a decent likelihood of recovery of function. If it's less than 50%, <clears throat> but more than 25%, they have some chance, but it's not as good. If they're more than 50%, we typically consider those to be non-viable or uh, scarred segments. This is helpful in making uh, in clinical decision making. Uh, if you want, you can also use the same approach to, to quantify perfusion. So, um, to show an example here. So, this is a movie showing <clears throat> contrast. And instead of a beating heart, what you're seeing now, what you're seeing is a, di it's a different time scale. So, you're seeing an image that's captured at each diastole, every heartbeat in diastole. So, you see contrast after given IV it appears in the right ventricle. This is the short axis image. Appears in the right ventricle. That's the brightening there. Then appears in the left ventricle, and then we'll. we'll blush or perfuse the myocardium. So you can quantify the rate of, uh, in, in a per segment basis, quantify the rate of contrast appearance in, in those and, uh, and get both a qualitative assessment of perfusion as well as uh, a quantitative, like, much like you can do with PET. So only PET and cardiac MR, possibly CT, this, this same approach can be used, uh, but not commonly used now. But there are definitely validated measures with cardiac MRI to, to do this. Um, so if, quanti if absolute quantitation of perfusion is important, this is a way to do it. And that can be done both with stress and uh, under resting conditions, but vasodilator and resting conditions. And here's an example of how you quantify that. So um, this, the, the panel that you see here, you, you typically you reference the signal intensity to the LV cavity. That's the black curve uh, there on the, on the right-hand side with time. So you see an increase after you give the contrast. The red curve would be a normal segment of myocardium, and the blue is, a, is a, uh, an ischemic segment, so it takes longer for the signal intensity to increase, and it doesn't increase as fast. So by looking at these rates, you can perform a, uh, uh, an absolute quantitation flow. There's ways of, uh, of assessing uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy also using, uh, much like you do with dobutamine stress echo, you can do a dobutamine wall motion. Uh, you can do this with, with cardiac MR tagging to assess regional wall motion, you know, including regional strains, if you want to have additional quantification. So this is very similar to the approach that you would do, use with dobutamine stress echo. Uh, there's data that the, the, at least the gadolinium enhancement has uh, correspondence to prognosis. <clears throat> so here's a, a number of studies and uh, conducted through a meta-analysis. Um, and if you see the, the big diamond there, the bottom, the uh, patients with no late gadolinium enhancement, ischemic patients with no late gadolinium enhancement have improved prognosis compared to, um, compared to patients with, with more. And this is just present or absent. If you look at uh, the, the bar chart there on the right, see that this uh, is both for combined uh, major outcomes, including death and MI, and then uh, the two individual. All right, uh, valvular disease, I just show this because this is some of the work that we've done here. Volumes are very important as you're trying to follow uh, patients. It can be important in certain patients who are trying to follow with valvular heart disease. So uh, here's some work that um, uh, came out of uh, Lou Dell'Italia's lab that we, we participated in, uh, patients with, with, uh, who had cardiac MR. These are patients with uh, mitral, severe mitral regurgitation. So see here on the left side, uh, you see the shape of the, this, in this two-chamber view, the shape of the left ventricle and left atrium, and a patient without severe MR, and a patient on the right with severe MR. And I think you can see that despite these two patients having the exact same LV dimension, which is the blue, the blue and red line, if you can see those there on the, uh, on the image, despite having the same dimension and the same length, the patient on the right with severe MR is a much more spherical ventricle, and a sphere or a half of a sphere has a bigger volume than a cone, which is essentially what the, what the control patient looks like. So the spherical remodeling uh, of the mid cavity and apex has a correspondingly much larger volume than a patient with similar dimension but a normal shape. So if, uh, 
um, we have reason to believe that the volumes are going to be more important than, than just using a, a, a one-dimensional tool like you would use with echocardiography. And then uh, on the right, is uh, this is another paper of patients with severe MR that were treated with beta blockers uh, showing the preservation of uh, maintenance of ejection fraction instead of the decline in ejection fraction. The, the right-hand side is patients who uh, received beta blocker therapy. The left-hand side is the ejection fraction of patients who did not uh, receive uh, placebo. So beta blockers, uh, through using MRI, a sensitive way to measure the ejection fraction was shown to help maintain EF in these patients. Uh, just a few other applications that we use quite a bit. Uh, patients with congenital heart disease, obviously important in, in um, the world of heart failure. So there's, there's a, a number of uh, studies in different conditions, especially tetralogy, since it's so common. Uh, and when we look at the right ventricle in these patients, there's a, a lot of data that the right ventricle size is, can be used as a <clears throat> for planning, both for prognosis and for planning time to do a pulmonary valve replacement. Um, Contricted pericarditis can be, can be nicely evaluated with cardiac MR, both by looking directly at the pericardium as well as looking for tethering of the pericardium to the, to the myocardium. And then if you're um, uh, patients with primary rhythm disorders, often associated with heart failure, uh, can, <coughs> can, um, you can localize substrate and predict risk of sudden death. All right, moving on to non-ischemic cardiomyopathy now. There are several patterns. We're often, we're often asked to do a cardiac MR as a patient who's known to have non-ischemic disease. They have an arteriogram with no severe coronary disease. And then we're asked to do the MRI to try to help decide what it is. Is, is it some infiltrative process? Is it you know, idiopathic cardiomyopathy? So there are some patterns. And uh, if you can see here, the patient on the, on the left doesn't have any abnormal dilated cardiomyopathy with no abnormal late gadolinium enhancement. The myocardium is dark everywhere. The patient on the right uh, I think you can particularly see on those short axis views, there's a, in the septum, there is a, a, a small amount of bright signal right in the middle of the septum. This, is, this pattern was recognized as called a mid-wall stripe and uh, has adverse prognostic implications if it's present. And here's some of that. So in patients with dilated cardiomyopathy, this is the um, uh, event-free survival. And this is looking at uh, ICD shocks, death, and hospitalization. So patients with late abnormal late gadolinium enhancement had, uh, had, had worse prognosis. And the, the more the late gadolinium in these lower curves, the more the late gadolinium enhancement, the worse the prognosis. More likely death, hospitalization, and ICD shocks. Um, amyloidosis is another condition where we're frequently asked to evaluate or possible amyloidosis. There's a couple of typical patterns of, of gadolinium contrast enhancement that are seen in these. Um, <clears throat> this is a little bit challenging sometimes because often we don't get good images on these patients because one of the typical patterns is an, is an inability to, to get a good nulling of the myocardium. So often if our images look bad, and despite multiple attempts to try to get a good image, this can be, this to us suggests that amyloidosis might, might well be on the differential. And um, here's a, and the presence of late gadolinium enhancement is, is important prognostically in these patients, both for uh, AL amyloidosis as well as the ATTR. Uh, you see on these, these, uh, these two panels, the uh, event-free survival patients, the blue curve is the patients with no abnormal late gadolinium, and then, um, and then you see, the, uh, depending on the amount, the green and the, and the uh, amber curves there. So the, the, this is followed out to around uh, four, three to four years, and See, these pa the patients with presence of abnormal late gadolinium enhancement, by both types of amyloidosis have a very poor prognosis. Much better prognosis than they don't. Okay, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, I don't think we talked much about at this meeting, but um, they often have a typical pattern. You know, these, are, these are generally not hard to diagnose. Uh, you know, the clinical phenotype is probably there, but what does gadolinium add to this? Well, there is a, this is a well-recognized pattern of late gadolinium enhancement that these patients have, typically with small, um, small focal areas of abnormal gadolinium at the insertion point of the, uh, where the, where the uh, left or the right ventricle inserts at the anterior side and the inferior side into the, into the septum. So, uh, I don't know, I'll show you that. These, these small areas, these small focal areas, So patients who have that also have a worse prognosis. And 
that's seen here. So the patients, and that's uh, stratified according to the amount of abnormal late gadolinium. So there's almost a linear relationship here between risk of uh, sudden cardiac death or ICD shock, resuscitated death uh, in patients uh, according to the amount of late gadolinium enhancement. Um, and even in patients who don't have any other hypertrophic patients with no other features that suggest high risk of death, there's, uh, if those patients have abnormal late gadolinium, they also have an increased risk, despite the absence of any other risk factors. All right, um, some of the things that are being done nowadays, those are the kind of the traditional, uh, well-recognized and easy to do techniques with, with uh, cardiac MRI. So uh, tissue kits, volumes, measuring ejection fraction, and tissue, you know, qualitative, mainly qualitative tissue characterization using late gadolinium enhancement. But there are other ways that we can do a little bit more quantitative assessment that may be useful. Um, currently, mainly for research purposes, but these are emerging techniques. So. Uh, I mentioned that the, the gadolinium-based contrast agents, most of the ones that we use, all the ones that are clinically approved, FDA approved, are extracellular agents. And they, so they get into the myocardium, and they're eventually cleared. They're then taken back up uh, in lymphatics and, uh, and back into capillaries, redistributed and cleared renally. So they have some pharmacokinetic properties. But because they're in the extracellular space, you can use this. There's a way to use the, the information to actually quantitate an extracellular volume fraction, or ECV or uh, ECV fraction. You see people call this different things. So most of the papers call it ECV. It's really an extracellular volume fraction that we quantify, but usually called ECV. So it's increased in many disease conditions. Uh, this, you know, this is known from histologic studies. Uh, forget the MRI, just histologic studies, patients with chronic kidney disease, hypertension, and, and a number of, uh, of systemic diseases that affect the heart, the, the LV, in a global or homogeneous way, are not necessarily easy to see using the, the, you know, the eyeball test of late gadolinium enhancement, but might have an increased extracellular, extracellular volume that we could quantify using the MRI. Um, if there's big differences regionally, then we can see it. If not, we have to go a little, be a little more sophisticated. So that's what we say here, these diffuse abnormalities. So we can use a technique known as T1 mapping. The contrast affects the T1 value, which is a property of how the uh, pro water protons relax. And by shortening the T1 time, the contrast brightens the signal, and uh, we can measure the T1 value in, in the tissue. And then there's a way to quantify from that the extracellular volume fraction. So um, without going into too much of the details, there's a, a technique known as the look locker. This was recognized early on. As, this was initially developed as a way to help us get a good image, a good eyeball image. But then it was recognized this actually is a very nice way to, to quantify the T1 value. So um, here's what happens after you give contrast with time, the signal intensity and the signal intensity tends to initially increase, and then as time goes on, it decreases. This is the clearance of contrast out of the myocardium. So this T1 value, as you see here in the, in, the, um, in the graph, increases back up towards a native value sometime after you give the, the contrast agent. And this is reflected in the signal intensity that you see. Uh, and eventually, we'll return to the native value. So the, the myocardium without any contrast has a native value of T1, which is somewhere around 1,000 milliseconds. By comparing, after you give contrast, by comparing the T1 value that you measure in myocardium with the T1 value in the blood pool and knowing the extracellular volume of the blood pool, which is 1 minus the hematocrit, you can, you can then infer the extracellular volume in the tissue. And you see the panel on the right, there's a very good agreement with histology. So this is, um, this is, the, uh, this is on the x-axis is the, is the gadolinium contrast-based measurement of the extracellular volume, and on the y-axis is the histologic uh, measurement. And you see the, the, the line, and then that line, uh, the thinner line there is a line of identity. You see the actual, the fitted line of the measured data is, uh, it, it's not superimposed, not perfect agreement, but the slope is very close to one. So uh, this is a very nice index of the true extracellular volume fraction. There's even a consensus statement from the Society for Cardiovascular Magnetic Resonance on how to do this and how to, how to do the quantification and uh, how to express the results. Um, <clears throat> and here's, a, here's, a, here's an example of how these data can be used for prognosis. So uh, by, by measuring the extracellular volume fraction in, 
about 800 heart failure patients, low EF heart failure patients. They, they included hypertrophs and amyloidosis patients. They didn't look at infarcted segments because those, uh, those have much, much, much uh, <laughs> higher extracellular volume. So just looking at the, the supposedly normal myocardium in these, in these patients. Um, the event-free survival here is plotted going out to, um, I think this is going out to about two years. Or sorry, uh, this is going out, yeah, two years. So uh, these patients, the patients with the intertiles of extracellular volume fraction, the ones with the highest amount of, of uh, fibrosis or extracellular volume, much more likely to progress to transplant or LVAD. All right, um, kind of quickly wrapping up. Other possible areas where cardiac MRI might help the assessment of heart failure in the future. Uh, Dr. Schweitzer talked yesterday about ventricular vascular coupling. And uh, so there's a, an MR technique to it, which I really didn't go into today to assess flow. Uh, I think this could be a, a very nice means of, of looking at diastolic heart failure in the future. This is very, you know, very investigational right now. Uh, NMR spectroscopy has been attractive for a long, long time, but looking both at proton NMR as well as phosphorus NMR to look at high energy energetics and uh, ATP turnover. Uh, this is uh, it's challenging, but there may be promise for this in, at some point. Uh, we can do regional strain analysis using tagging MRI. There's a possibility uh, to, much like you do with brain fiber tracking, neur neural fiber tracking, you can do a similar kind of approach. Steve Hogwiz is here and has, has, uh, has investigated some of this. Um, in, the, in the myocardium, looking at myocardial, my, myocellular uh, architecture and, and fibrillar array. Uh, people have been talking for a long time about using MR as the imaging tool for interventional procedures. So you replace your fluoroscopy with, uh, with the MRI. Um, this is challenging. Not many places are doing it, but a few. There's a potential for using targeted imaging agents. So you cu couple your gadolinium uh, ion, not just to something that goes into the extracellular volume, but maybe to some compound that localizes to some particular abnormal protein. Uh, this could be used for diagnosing specific diseases. <clears throat> uh, a few other things here. I mentioned that we've talked about the T1 mapping mainly with gadolinium contrast. There's also the possibility of looking at, at how disease pro systemic disease processes affect the native T1, even without use of any contrast. And uh, then more and more routine use in patients with implanted devices. It's kind of emerging. So here's an example of that. So um, this is a patient, you, you know, I wouldn't know it by looking, almost wouldn't know it at all, but this is a patient with a, um, with a MR, MR conditional pacemaker or, or cardiac MR or MR approved pacemaker that was implanted on the left chest. That's a four chamber view. Let's see if I can make that move. It's not playing. But, but I, looking at that, I wouldn't even have known that this patient wouldn't necessarily have known that this patient had a, a pacemaker in place. We're always concerned, number one, about safety issues. Is it going to damage, the, is it going to hurt the patient, or is it going to damage the, the, the device? And then second of all, are we going to get a good image because of artifacts from it? But you see, this is, a, this is a very good quality image here. And this is that same patient. The patient has uh, cardiac sarcoidosis. You see all this very abnormal patchy contrast enhancement all over the place in the LV. Um, on the other hand, so that's a pacemaker. That's a dual chamber pacemaker. This on the right is a, is a patient with a MR, this is MR conditional, so they're approved for MR use, but this is an MR conditional defibrillator. And so, um, I don't know if you can see that, that movie play that should, should loop, I guess it's not. But so this, basically you have all this target shaped artifact with these dark rings all over the place and you can barely see the left ventricle. So it's, it's hard to even assess the ejection fraction on this patient. So I think we're still, we're still trying to figure out the best way to do this. There are some techniques to try to mitigate some of this, but uh, they're not always available. In fact, not available on most scanners. They uh, totally have to be developed on site. Last thing I want to mention is uh, this relates to a um, uh, poster that was shown last night by uh, one of the medical students working with me, Forrest Gamble. The, the ability to measure the actual stiffness of, of uh, tissue, including it's been done in the liver using MR elastography, been done a little bit in the heart but measure a parameter known as the shear modulus. So this is, a, this is basically the resistance of a material to a shear deformation. So if you apply a force to it, it tends to, in a shearing direction to try to make it deform, it's how stiff it is to resist that, is the shear, shear modulus. Um, so again, this is used, the MR elastography technique is done with the liver to diagnose cirrhosis, so stiff liver cirrhosis. Um, but we got to thinking that 
using tagging MRI, you're basically doing, a, you know, as you're probably aware, the heart has a twisting deformation that occurs because of the helical fiber orientation of the, of the cardiomyocytes. And so there should be a sheer resistance to deformation of this also. Um, so uh, I won't go into the details of the approach, but this is looking, this is, this is time, and this panel is on the, on the upper right, uh, time, and uh, looking at the, the twist angle in a, in a patient, this is a patient with resistant hypertension, and by looking at how these move with time during the diastolic period, when, you know, say there may be some active suction, relax, active relaxation, but especially during the later part of that, there's, uh, it's thought to be passive motion. Uh, we measure the shear modulus, these numbers that we got out, this is resistant hypertension patients and control patients, these numbers agree fairly well with uh, estimates that have been done using animal models with MR elastography and also ex vivo samples that have been tested. You can also measure frictional damping. And there we, um, Forrest was able to show that there is a difference between uh, higher shear modulus and greater damping, greater friction in patients with resistant hypertension compared to control patients. So uh, I want to thank the people who have uh, worked on maybe on these data that I've shown here, several other people have, uh, have contributed in the lab, but uh, the data I've shown today, uh, we work with uh, three cardiac radiologists, uh, Dr. Singh is here, seeing him, uh, also Dr. Nath and Sonavani, here at UAB, are great, uh, great collaborators and co-workers, Garima Aurora, I don't think I've seen Garima here, um, this is Pankaj's uh, wife, uh, is, uh, does cardiac MR along with me, uh, is a cardiologist, uh, Oleg is here, and um, has contributed to a great deal to a lot of the research projects that we've done. Uh, Forrest Gamble is the medical student who had the data that I just showed. And uh, Rivki is a, is a biomedical engineering graduate student who's uh, working with us, who's going to do the same kind of approach but using a static uh, formulation instead of a dynamic formulation. And then Himantra Gupta, uh, our former colleague, is now in New Jersey, but uh, also uh, contributed quite a bit to, to the direction of where we're going now. So um, I think I'm out of time. So thank, thank you very much. I want to say, I, I didn't put them on here.